Father in heaven, once again as we come into your presence, it's with the joy and understanding of the fact of the great love that you have for us. A love that so much you allowed your one and only son to die on the cool cross for us. And all we can really say to you about that is just thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us the way you do. Lord, as we say every Sunday, we're a needy people. We've got so many, many needs in our church today. We thank Lord of Morgan. We're thankful for the progress that's going on. We pray that you continue to have your hand upon her. Be with the therapists and doctors. We pray that you give them special wisdom and guidance. Pray for Terry and O.D., Kevin and Carl and Mason and all the rest of the family that you'd encourage them. And then, Lord, I pray especially for Clara and Maggie and Lucy. These three precious ladies would be here if they could. Pray for Kathy Blue that's got another one of those migraines, and we just lift her up and pray that you touch her in a special way. Continue to have your hand on Lori with this kidney problem that she's facing. Just touch her in a special way. Father, we thank Billy and Shirley. We're glad that you've touched them. We pray that you continue to touch it bring healing to both of their bodies. Pray, Lord, for faith, and we pray for Gary that this week will be traveling. We pray that you grant them traveling mercies. And Lord, we think of Cassara and Kenneth, the family, they've all got the flu, and we just lift them all up to you. Pray, Lord, that you work some miracles as only you can do. And then, Lord, we thank Norma, we pray that you continue to have your hand upon her. Lord, we thank Sam's two sisters, and we just pray that you touch them and be close to them in a special way. And Father, we pray for George and Carolee that are both going through some physical problems, and we pray that you just touch them. That's only you can do. And then, Lord, uh, I look at their altar, and I see parents and grandparents down here that have unsaved loved ones that are praying for them, and I just pray that you touch them. Pray for Melissa, Lord, that you touch her with the healthy, health issue she has on her foot. Just be close to her. Continue to touch Stephanie with the health issues that she's facing. And then, Lord, we think of our country. We lift our leaders up. We pray especially that you would send some special guidance to their hearts and their minds, starting with our president, our vice president, our congress, our state, county, and city leaders. We pray for the Church of the Nazarene, our general superintendent, that you just bless them. We pray, Lord, that uh, you'd be with our own district superintendent, Brother Russ and Sister Gail. Bless them. Uh, they're in meetings this week, and I pray that you just bless both of them physically and spiritually, and may they come back refreshed. And then, Lord, we pray for these that are at your altar. We know what's going on. We just pray in a special way. That you'd meet them right where they are. Undertake for the need that they bring to you today. Pray that you just work it all out. We know there's nothing that's too difficult for you. We thank you, Lord, for this little miracle baby that's up here at 10 year old now. The Lord has just touched in such a special way. And Sarah Grace, just touch her and bless her. Lord, we just want you to know we love you. Continue to touch Vicki with this back problem that she's dealing with. Just touch her in a special way. And then, Lord, undoubtedly, I've probably forgotten some, but I'm thankful that you are one who never forgets. And Lord, as we pray each Sunday, we ask now that you walk around our altar and up and down each pew. And would you give each one of us that big daddy's hug that we need? And again, we want to ask you to bless America. Pray, Lord, that you would help us to realize that we are one nation founded under God. Help us not to forget that. Bless us now, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
she slips in, trying to fade into the faces. The girl's teasing laughter is carrying farther than they know, farther than they know. But if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing? Then there is a way. There is a way. Are better out on the road. But if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing? Why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing? Then there is a way. If we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing? Then there is a way. Jesus is the way. Resentment and thoughts of revenge. 
Now the act or the hurt or whatever it was that offended you will probably always stay with you. You'll always remember it. But when you forgive the person who offended you, it helps let loose of the grip that it has on you. And it helps you focus on more positive things in your life. Forgiveness can even lead to feelings of understanding, empathy, and compassion for the one that hurts you. Now, forgiveness does not mean that you deny the person's responsibility for hurting you, or that it doesn't minimize or justify the wrong, but you can forgive the person who's hurt you without excusing the act. When you do that, forgiveness brings us a kind of peace that will help us go on with life. Do you know there are benefits from forgiving someone? There are some statistics that talk to you about forgiving. When we forgive, we let go of grudges, we let go of bitterness, and when we do that, it helps restore happiness to our lives, health, and peace. Here's what some of the, the stats are. Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships. It can give you greater spiritual and psychological well-being. It gives you less anxiety, stress, or hostility. One of the things I've learned a long time ago, when someone hurts you, and you know, usually the people that hurt you are people you're close to. It might be a best friend, it might be a family member, it might be somebody that you really have a lot of confidence in. They do something that just tears you apart. And so if you don't forgive them, here's what happens every time you run into them. You feel like running into them. Every time you see their face, every time you hear their name, you relive that hurt. And so what it amounts to, when you don't forget someone who's hurting, who's hurt you, you are allowing them to hurt you over and over and over and over and over and over again. So why in the world would you want to give them that kind of power? Forgive them and let go of it. Another thing the medical system tells us, there are fewer symptoms of depression when you forgive. The stronger you have a stronger immune system, you have an improved heart rate, and you have higher self-esteem. Why in the world is it so easy for us to hold on to grudges? And if you don't think we do, just think of little kids. It's amazing how they don't forget. When you're hurt by someone that you love or you trust, you usually become angry, confused, or just hurt. And if you dwell on that hurtful situation, grudges begin to form. Those that have resentment, and then it turns into bitterness and it takes root. And if you allow negative feelings to crowd out positive feelings, you find yourself just swallowed up in the root of bitterness. And you become a bitter person. And you know, you can always tell when somebody's full of bitterness, can't you? They walk in, you go, how you done today? they are fine. Ask me again and I'll tell you the same. Right? You can tell. But when somebody's just kind of let go of it, there's a smile on your face. They can quote Psalm 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Because God's in control. And God's going to take care of everything. So I want to share with you this morning for just a little bit is the importance of forgiving one another. And uh, if you would, would you stand with me as we on the reading of God's Word? I'll be reading from... Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, and then Colossians 3, 13. Paul tells us, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. And bear with each other, and forgive one another. If any of you has agreements against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Lord, these next few minutes, I pray that you bless the words that come out of my mouth. I pray, Lord, that you would send some healing to each of us. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. One man said forgiveness is the flip side of confession. And if confession to others is meaningful, then there must also be forgiveness in return from others. It is crucial for successful Christian living that we be straight in our thinking on forgiveness. I want to share three, very quick, three main points with you. The first point is this, the attitude of forgiveness. 
Now, there are some basic attitudes that are essential to being able to forgive other people. The first one is refuse to make your heart a harbor for bitterness. That's an act of the mind. Refuse. I'm not going to let you make me mad all the time every time I see you. I'm going to forgive you and, and let go with it. If you have that same personality, that's real easy for you. And you ought to be amen in me because that's what you do. Amen. You get upset easy, but then you're real quick to forgive or seek forgiveness. It's easy for you, but for some of the melancholy personalities, it's a little harder. But we have to work at it. It starts out with rejoicing. This is the day of the Lord of Thrain. A childhood accident caused Elizabeth Barrett to live a life of got married. Their wedding had to be in secret because her father disapproved of it. Well, after they got married, they sailed to Italy where they ended the rest of their life. They lived in Italy the rest of their life. But Elizabeth never tried, never stopped trying to keep the relationship or get a relationship. She would send a minimum of one letter a week to her parents. Minimum of one week, a letter a week. But not once did she get a reply. And the story goes that after 10 years, she received a very large box in the mail. And it was full of all the letters that she sent to her parents. Not a single one had been opened. Today, those letters are some of the most beautiful classical literature, English literature that's around. And had her parents only opened a few of them, maybe they would have forgiven her and had that good relationship with her. I read the story about a couple who had been married for 15 years and they were beginning to have some disagreements that were a little bit beyond what the ordinary was. And they talked about it and the husband agreed to the wife's plan. And her plan was this, we will have fault boxes. And in that fault box, we'll put a slip each day, the things that you or I do that irritate the other one. Okay. So the wife got right into it. She was real excited about it and every day she put it in. She put things like this. Leaving the jelly jar, lid off, leaving wet towels on the floor, dirty clothes not in the hamper, and on and on and on and on. You know how it goes. Well, at the end of the month, the last day of the month, right after supper, they got their boxes out. And they shared their boxes, and the husband went, went through his. Hmm. 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 You know. And when he was finally done, it was the wife's turn. She was kind of sitting there with one of these smug looks like. But there was a problem with hers. For every piece of paper had the same words on it. There were just three words. And those words were, I love you. Fault boxes. Second thing, keep short accounts of wrongs that have been done to you. Keep short accounts. Paul said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So when you wake up in the morning, if you're still angry about something that's happened to you, forgive it or deal with it. Forgive it or deal with it. Don't let it just stay until you become a bitterness. You know, bitterness can become just like cancer. Don't let that happen. Get rid of it. The next word, uh, abstain. That means to stop. Abstain from seeking revenge. Do you know that God is in charge of all revenge? That's the neat thing. You don't have to worry about getting even. God will take care of it. He really will. He doesn't take care of it the way you or I probably would like him to do it, but he takes care of it, doesn't he? Amen. Paul said in Romans 12, 19, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. When somebody does you dirty. There'll be a day of count, or recounting for it, or accounting for it. God will take care of it. And when you totally give your life to God, you don't have to worry about it. You say, well, God, that person did some damage to you, and to me, it hurt me, and I'm yours. Get him. Get him. Get him. And then, yeah, that's it. But you have to forgive him. But Lord, I was just kidding. You don't have to get him. But just, I want to forgive him for what they did. And I forgive him. And then let him take care of it. Just forgive him and go on with life. Leonardo da Vinci, when he was painting The Last Supper, the story goes that he got into a very bad argument with a fellow painter. And it was so heated. It, Leonardo got so upset 
that he decided he was going to pay this painter back. And so he painted the face on Judas, the betraying disciple of this painter that he'd argued with. And that way all of history would be able to see this fellow's face as the one who betrayed Jesus Christ. He finished it and everyone that saw it realized who it was. And then Leonardo decided, well, it's time for me to paint the face of Jesus. But you know, he could not paint Jesus' face. He could not do it. No matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't come up with the details. And he thought about it and thought about it. And finally the Lord talked to him and said, well, here's the reason you can't. It's because of what you did to this fellow painter. And so he made a decision. He repainted the face of Judas with somebody else. And once he did that, he was able to paint the face of Jesus. How important it is. Don't allow people who hurt you to keep hurting you. Forgive them. Let it go. John Kellinger tells a story about the Jihara Indians down in Ecuador. They have a very unusual custom. When they tuck their children in bed at night, they whisper the names of enemies into the ears of their kids and say, you must hate these people. They're no good. They'll hurt you. They'll kill you. They'll rape. They'll murder. They'll pillage. you got to hate them. And so that way, that's how grudges and feuds kept going on among the tribes. It's kept telling your kids that. Wouldn't it be great if, if we all would whisper in our kids' ears at night, forgiveness? Talk to them about the love of God, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The next word is cultivate. Now, that also could be a synonym for that would be develop. So, cultivate a forgiving spirit. You know, when someone hurts you, it's not the easiest thing in the world. To look at them and say, I forgive you, and really mean it. Because it turned your world upside down. But remember, our model is Jesus Christ, who was arrested, falsely tried and convicted, sentenced to crucifixion, beaten until the blood just poured down his back. He was carried across, beaten through the streets of Jerusalem. And when he got to where he was crucified on the hill called Golgotha, he looked down at that howling mob and said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Remember, Christ is our model. He's our example. And the next word is resolve. That means to determine or make a decision. Again, it's a matter of the will. Resolve to forgive in your heart even when you don't have to. Even when you're not called to do it. Mark 11, 25 tells us, And when you stand praying... If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in Heaven may forgive you of your sin. Did you get that? Yeah. You have to forgive so you can be forgiven. And remember, Christ is our example from the cross. And the benefits of forgiveness are then yours no matter what the other person does or says. I don't know about you, but I've had some people that hurt me and I, I forgave them. And I went to them and said, you know what, you really did hurt me, but I want you to know I forgive you. And they looked at me and said, I don't, I don't know you forgiveness. You need to forgive me. Really? <laughs> You're just all mixed up. And so, you know, the first time that happens, I, you get to where you are. I wish I wouldn't said I forgive you. I'm going to put your lights out. So sometimes knowing personalities, instead of Saying, I forgive you, you say it up here. You don't tell them. If you know they're going to fight with you, you just forgive them up here. Tell the Lord, I forgive them. Because that's what personalities are. But that way you get forgiveness and you get the benefits of forgiveness no matter what the other person says or does. It's a mind thing, isn't it? Second thing is the act of forgiveness. Well, forgive immediately. Forgive immediately. Again, we have the example of Christ on the cross. A forgiving spirit that is free of bitterness will make this life and make this episode so much easier for us to forgive people. The second thing we need to do is forgive fully. Fully. You know what we usually tend to do? We impose conditions. I'll forgive you this once, but you better not do it again. We forgive them, and that's it. We don't put any conditions on I forgive you for what you did. 
Forgiveness and forgiving are always linked in the scripture. And we find forgiveness to the degree that we grant it to other people. And Jesus gives us three very important verses that talk about that. Matthew 6, 14, 15, and then Matthew 18, 35. Let me read these three verses to you. It's in red. Jesus says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But then there's that little three-letter conjunction. But, if you don't do it, if you don't forget others their sins, then your Father won't forgive you of your sins. This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. It doesn't matter what they say, what they think, what they do. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. If someone does your own, forgive them and just take off. It doesn't do a bit of good to hold a grudge, does it? You hold a grudge and all these things I talked about at the beginning, high blood pressure, stress, anxiety, it's not worth it. I heard a story of a guy named Old Joe. He was dying. And he decided that uh, after being at odds with his friend Bill, who used to be his best friend for years and years and years or something, he couldn't even remember what he was mad at him about, but he just knew he was supposed to be mad. He called him in and he said, I want to talk to you. He said, I'm dying. But he said, I don't want to go into eternity with this much between us. And so he kind of... Reluctantly, with great effort, he apologized for all the things that he'd done and said to Bill. And then he said, um, I forgive you too for your offenses. Well, everything seemed to be going just great until Bill got red late. Bill went out the door and Joe hollered, but, there's that little conjunction again, remember if I get better, this really doesn't count. And you say, oh, but some of you have done that too, haven't you? Our third thing, failure to forgive may indicate that you've never been forgiven or keep you from being forgiven. And uh, David Jeremiah's turning point in devotional of March 20, 2010, he tells a story back in the early days of TV, there were two TV characters that were complaining about one of their mutual friends. And every time they'd see that guy, he'd walk up and hit him in the chest. And they hated that. Both of them, oh, I hate that. And one of the guys looked at the other one and said, well, I've got it all figured out and I'm going to fix him real good. What are you going to do? I stuck a stick of dynamite in my vest pocket so the next time he hits me, he's going to lose his hand. <laughs> He never stopped to realize he's going to do more damage to himself than to his friend, did he? Jeremiah says this, an unforgiving spirit is exactly like that. The Bible tells us to beware of the root of bitterness that can spring up and defile many. Jesus told us to be quick in our forgiveness. And his phrase, 70 times 7, doesn't mean that 490 times you got to do it the 491st time you clean your clock. It meant that you develop a period where you just automatically forgive. It's not, it's not a question of if, it's a matter of when are you going to do it. Just constantly be forgiving. Whenever we get hurt by someone, we have a choice to make. We can either hold a grudge and try to get even, or we can just give it to Jesus. Process it on our knees, releasing the bitterness and leaving the matter in God's hand. Jeremiah said, don't walk around with a stick of dynamite in your pocket. Don't do it. And then thirdly, the aftermath of forgiveness. Forgive finally. Finally. Once a matter has been forgiven, it should never be brought up again. Don't bring it up. If you bring it up, that means there's something defective in your element of forgiveness. Now, the Jewish rabbis at the time of Jesus taught that someone only had to forgive another person who had hurt them three times. Because that was based on Amos chapter 1, 3 through 13, where God would forgive Israel's enemies three times. And the fourth time, they'd punish them. So that was the way they were teaching the Jewish people. 
And so when Peter said, well, I, I, you know, is it okay to forgive him seven times? That's more than double. I think he kind of thought, well, Jesus is going to say, good job. Pat him on the back. Didn't happen the way they did. It happened just the opposite. He kind of told him what was what. But once a man has been forgiven, it's no longer proper to think about it. Get it out of your system. Are you going to totally be able to forget it? No, because we have one who hates us and who always reminds us of our past, doesn't he? But don't dwell on it. Give it to Christ and move on. And then we need to forgive repeatedly. Again, that same passage, Matthew 18, Peter came to Jesus, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven, seven times. Typically, what we do is we say, well, I forgive you this time, but you better not let it happen again. Right? I forgive you this time, but don't let it happen again. We should forgive the sin of others just as often as we expect God to forgive us of our favorite sins. Have you ever, have you ever asked God to forgive you for something and maybe a week later you have to go back and ask Him for the same thing again? A week later the same thing? I'm, I'm really thankful for 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us five times. Right? No. No, there's no limit. And how neat it is that if we mess up, we can go back and ask Him to forgive us. We need to think the same way to people who hurt us, who offend us, who wrong us. There shouldn't be a limit. We just forgive them. And sometimes we look at people that have that attitude and we go, you just make me sick. Nobody can be that perfect. Really? You can you really can. If our model is Jesus, we can do it, can't we? Amen. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So we can do it if we make a decision up here that we're going to do it. But sometimes, somehow, for some reason, it's just easier for us to hold a grudge. You know, I, sometimes we just think, well, they hurt me and I'm not going to forget it. Are, are you, are, do you forgive me? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I forgive you. No, I don't forgive you. Yeah, I forgive you. Inside, I hate your guts. But outside, oh, yes, I forgive you. And you go on day after day after day. And every time you see them, you hear their name, you get hurt over and over again. Same thing. That's dumb, you know? And that will cause all these things I talked about at the beginning. The high blood pressure, the stress, the anxiety, the low self-esteem. You know, when you allow somebody to hurt you and you don't forgive them, then you begin to imagine, well, everybody else must be saying the same thing about me. Everybody else must feel the same way that person does. And so when you walk into a room and people look at you, or someone says, hi, Nancy, how are you doing? Why? <laughs> Why? You got something you want to say to me? You just want to say hi. Why? You know? But isn't it amazing? We sit here and, and, you know, we do it with our kids. When they get upset and we try to point to them how stupid it is, but yet we do the same thing. You guys are just laughing at what I said, but you've been guilty of doing that. I have. And you kind of wonder, hello? Is there anybody awake up there? There's my old evangelist, she used to say, that's dumb that you dumb, 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 isn't it? A man once went to John Wesley after a service, and here's what he said. He said, Mr. Wesley, I never, ever forgive people who wronged me. And here's what John Wesley said. Then I hope, sir, that you never sin. If you don't forgive your brother who sins against you, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you when you sin. And that's something that I don't think we hear enough of. You're right. Amen. We have to forgive. That's what being a Christian is. The word Christian means Christ-like. Jesus forgave. And you and I can do that because all things work together for the good. Romans 8, 28. 
and I can do all things through who loves me. So we can do it. But it's a matter of decision. Am I going to forgive? Or am I going to be weighed down by bitterness, anxiety, stress? You know what? If you stop and think about having the freeness of conscience, the freeness of not being upset with anybody versus all these other problems, which would you rather have? Would you rather have the, the, the free, clean conscience and not being upset with somebody? Or would you rather be going around like this? Well, that'd be a rocket scientist figure that one out, dude. But again, it's a matter of the will. It's a matter of the heart. Lord, I forgive them. You may be in a situation where they've hurt you so bad that you can't really forgive them. And so the thing you need to do is say, Jesus, I know I'm supposed to forgive them. But right now, I really can't. I don't have the power. Would you forgive them for me? And would you help me to grow into that state of being able to forgive them? That'll work. How do I know it? I've done that. There's been some times in my life where some people have really hurt me. And you know, we guys, we don't tell anybody. How you doing? I'm fine. You can be fine on the outside and be dying on the inside. A lot of times that's because of unforgiveness. But how important it is if we just turn it over to Him and let Him take care of it. Would you stand with me? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Don't want to look around. I just want to close by asking you a couple of questions. Have I been talking to you? Or should I say, has the Holy Spirit been talking to you through my words? Has there been somebody that has hurt you so bad? Maybe it was yesterday, last week, a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, maybe 30 or 40 years ago. And you really haven't let go of it. It's weighing you down. It's wearing you down. You just can't get any peace. Maybe you don't sleep good. You've got health issues. Do you have someone that's really hurt you that you've never forgiven? You know, the good news, if you have, Jesus said, All ye who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me, and I will give you rest. If somebody's hurt you, he wants to come in and just take it. Why carry it around? You know, we live in a society today where people say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm on the church board, or I'm a Sunday school teacher, or I'm on the missionary council, and what would people say if I made a trip to the altar? You know, the majority of the people here would say, praise the Lord. There's a person that's being obedient to the calling of the Holy Spirit. I want to say a short prayer for you. I'd like to ask you if you'd like to come and kneel at the altar. The altar's open. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the ability that you've given us to seek and get forgiveness. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us in the same way to be able to forgive others who've hurt us, who've offended us, who have done some things to us that maybe have just worn us thin over years and years and years. Again, Lord, we just cry out to you. We pray in a special way that your Holy Spirit would just go over the congregation, speak to each one of us. And Lord, if there's one that's just been bound up by a spirit of unforgiveness, help them to come to your altar to seek your face and to just give it to you. I ask this in your name. One has come. Is there anybody else that would like to come? How is it with you? <clears throat> One more's coming. Is there another? One of my favorite songs when we have these kinds of services is there's room at the cross for you. Isn't that neat to know? No matter what's happened in your life, Jesus always has room for you. Is there anybody else that would like to come and pray?
Anybody else? One more. Some of you ladies, would you come and gather around Belinda? Some of you guys, would you come and carry? Father, what a joy it is to know that we can come to you and we can find solace, that we can find relief from everything that's going on in our lives. And Lord, uh, I pray especially for these three that have come, that whatever the issue might be, that you'd give them the ability and the power to forgive and to just lift this burden that's weighed them down. And Lord, just in coming, that's quite an indication that they want your help. They want the relief that only you can give. And Father, I pray right now that you would bring healing to these three, whatever it might be. Lord, you're a great God. You're a God that knows everything. You're a God that wants to give the very best that you have to your kids. And Lord, all of us, we accept that. We ask you, Lord, to just take away that burden that we've carried for such a long time. And Lord God, what a, what, a, what a great feeling comes our way when we just forgive and let go of it. And I pray right now, Lord, that these three that have come, that you would answer that prayer that they made that's on their hearts and that you forgive them. And draw them close to you. And I pray that even right now, they just sense a freedom that they haven't felt in a long time. A sense of freedom and a sense of your love for them. And a sense that this is the day the Lord has made and I'm going to make a conscious decision that I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it and no longer will there be anything that's going to hold me down or keep me back from the fullness of your love. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Lord, for answering prayers. And Jesus, what a thrill it is to know that you loved us so much. You died for us on a cruel cross at Calvary. Now again, I pray a special blessing for these three that have come. I pray, Lord, for those who didn't come, but maybe even right now they're praying in their seats, in their pews. I pray, Lord, that you'd hear their cries. Heal and answer and bring healing to our lives. And then, Lord, collectively, we, the people, your kids, we all say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Go with us now as we go our separate ways and give us a great name, the Lord. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Amen.